Hello everyone, Professor V here. This is the lecture for Biological Psychology Chapter 1, Scope, Outlook, and Neuroanatomy. Biological psychology is one of the most fascinating fields in the life sciences, in large part because it is truly multidisciplinary in scope and application. Most people are intrinsically curious about the genesis of behavior. Consider the proportions of everyday conversations that revolve around the motives and acts of the people and animals around us. A quick flip through the chapters in the text underscores the many levels of analysis employed in the study of the ultimate source of all animal behavior, the nervous system. Chapter one introduces specialized disciplines that contribute to biological psychology and organizes them into five general perspectives. One, description of behavior. Two, comparative and evolutionary approaches. Three, development and its biological characteristics over the lifespan. Four, biological mechanisms. And five, human application. This chapter also discusses the important contribution that animal research plays in our understanding of biological psychology. So are you excited as much as I am? Yeah? No? Oh, why not? Biological psychology is comprised of two fields, one being psychology, which is the scientific study of behavior and cognition or mental processes. The other field is neuroscience. This is a natural science that focuses on the structure and function of the entire nervous system. We will be discussing several different parts throughout the semester on the nervous system. Biological psychology, again, is the combination of two fields. It focuses on how biological processes inside of our body and brain influence behavior and cognition and understand the neuroscience underlying behavior and experience. You may hear me refer to this field as behavioral neuroscience because it is an alternate name for biological psychology. Neuroscience and psychology both have many subfields. Behavioral neuroscience is multidisciplinary in scope and draws on knowledge produced in diverse scientific fields in an effort to produce integrated descriptions of the generation of behavior. This involves work at many levels of analysis, from, molec from molecular interactions to views of the activity of the brain as a whole and the behavior of organisms in their natural setting. You can see here in this graphical representation that behavioral neuroscience is made up of all the subfields of both psychology and neuroscience. Let's discuss the absolute basic structure of the nervous system, the neuron, also called nerve cells and often referred to as brain cells even though they exist outside of the brain in various forms. There are approximately 86 billion in your head alone, so you can get an idea on how small they are. Nah, you really can't. That's how tiny they are. Unimaginably tiny. The neurons have several parts, the soma or the cell body in which the nucleus lies and the axon and dendrites. Neurons communicate with each other using electrochemical signals. The axons is responsible for sending this message to the next neuron and the dendrites are responsible for receiving messages from other neurons. The point in which two neurons communicate with one another is called the synapse. Each neuron in the, in the brain has multiple dendrites, thus trillions of synapses exist in your brain alone. Crazy, isn't it? Here are just some interesting facts on the neurons that are in your brain alone. My favorite is the one on the middle right. If you were to unravel all of your axons in your brain, you'll have enough axons to wrap them around the earth four times. That's crazy. Still, hard to actually picture how small they actually are. Another interesting one is that there are no pain receptors on the brain. Thankfully, too, because many types of brain surgery is done while you are awake. That would hurt if your brain could feel pain. That electrochemical message I mentioned earlier that is the basis of communication for all neurons. The electricity part of the message travels at 220 miles per hour. Think about that for a minute. The light information that is entering your eyes is being converted into electrical message. This message needs to travel to the back part of your brain because that is where visual information is processed at. 
that is a small amount of space for a message to travel 220 miles an hour. It's ridiculously fast. Behavioral neuroscience isn't just studied by psychological researchers, but neurologists and other types of physicians, biologists, since neuroscience is a life science, physiologists to understand how the inner working of the body affects behavior, engineers, and many other fields of science. There are many career opportunities in both university settings and private industry for people with interest in this field. The perspectives of biological psychology can be organized into five main groups. Analytical and functional descriptors of behavior provide information about the exact patterning and significance of the acts that make up a behavior. Evolutionary and comparative studies emphasize the continuity of behaviors across species, reveal principles of neural processing through examples, and place behavioral acts in an ecological setting. Developmental perspectives reveal principles of neural organization, the effects of environmental inputs and changes in neural systems, and the systematic alterations in the nervous system across the lifespan. Studies relating behavior to specific neural mechanisms reveal how the brain processes and integrates information and produces behavior. Applied research relates the findings of biological psychology to areas of concern to human society, such as the treatment of diseases, social issues, and issues of economic importance. When describing the behavior, you must be precise when describing the behavior you want to study. This will help eliminate confusion amongst your fellow researchers as well as yourself on what behavior you are looking at. So precision is key. You can describe the behavior on their structural traits or functional traits. Analytical and functional descriptions of behavior provide information about the exact patterning and significance of the acts that make up a behavior. The golden rule in psychology, in my opinion, is the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. That to me, to me, is the only thing that is absolute in psychology. So the best way to predict future behavior is understanding past behaviors. As a species, we need to understand how our behaviors have changed over time. Continuity is understanding the behaviors in which our ancestors performed for certain situations. And when I say ancestors, this doesn't just mean relatives from long ago that you've never met, but even relatives that are still alive today. Differences are studies to see how other species live in certain environments. If we can understand how they do, perhaps we can figure out how to as well. Differences in species often involve studying evolution of not just the human species, but all the species that live on this planet. Now, evolution is just a fancy word that means change over time, rather it be, rather it be physical changes or behavioral changes. And these changes take a very long time to develop. So evolutionary and comparative studies emphasize the continuity of behaviors across species, reveal pro principles of neural processes through examples, and place behavioral acts in an ecological setting. Despite what people may commonly think, we do have similarities with other species, some species more than others, but we are still all a unique individual. We just share common traits with each other and other species. You can see in this diagram that we have similarities with the penguin. We both have a vertebral column, must ingest organic nutrients to survive, nurse our young, etc. But there are many differences between each section of species, including intelligence, having opposable thumbs, etc. In addition to changes over time of our species, we must study the change in our own lifetime. Ontogeny is the process by which an individual changes in the course of its lifetime, that is, grows up and grows old. How do our behaviors change over the lifespan? By studying these evolving behaviors, it suggests that, it suggests more questions. What in the brain is changing to allow for these behaviors to occur? So developmental perspectives reveal principles of neural organization, the effects of environmental inputs and changes in neural systems, and the systematic alterations in the nervous system across the lifespan. 
What physiological response in the brain and body are responsible for certain behaviors and thought processes? How do neurons communicate to allow your hand to grasp a pencil and perform micro movements to write down notes as you listen to this lecture and think at the same time, Professor V looks so tiny. We need to understand this because if a behavior is unable to be performed, it could be due to a neurological problem. Studies relating behavior to specific neural mechanisms reveal how the brain processes processes and integrates information and produces behavior. And lastly, how can we apply all this information to humans in order for us to improve the quality of life and life expectancy? Because of behavioral neuroscience, many abnormalities of behavior as well as malfunctions of the brain have been alleviated or at least made treatable. Applied research relates the findings of biological psychology to areas of concern to human society, such as the treatment of diseases, social issues, and issues of economic importance. Here is a table describing the five research perspectives we just discussed. It applies the perspective to sexual behavior, learning, learning and memory, and language and communication. As you can see, the description for sexual behavior is referring to something very specific within a sexual behavior. We know exactly what the researchers are looking for. The evolution perspective looks at how is sexual behavior the same or different in other species. In this case, how are hormones involved in sexual behavior in other species? The developmental perspective looks at the human species and the focus is on how do re reproductive and secondary sex characteristics develop over the course of one person's life. The mechanisms perspectives of sexual behavior looks at how the brain responds to sexual behavior and thought patterns. What areas of the brain are neurons active during sexual intercourse would be another good question for the mechanisms perspective. And lastly, how can we manipulate sexual behavior biologically or medically would be the application perspective of sexual behavior. Moving on to the three approaches on how to relate brain and behavior to one another. There is the somatic intervention, behavioral intervention, and correlations. In experiments involving somatic intervention, bodily variables are manipulated in a precise and controlled manner, and consequent effects on behavior are noted. Just as in all research, there are variables in which we need to understand in somatic intervention. Researchers alter a structure or function of the brain or body to see how the alteration changes behavior. In this case, the somatic intervention is the independent variable. The independent variable is what is under control of the researcher and is applied or given to the subject. The behavior that researchers measure if there was an effect from the independent variable is the dependent variable. If the dependent variable changes, the independent variable had an effect. However, if it's the effect the researcher wanted, is a whole different ballgame. Here's an example of somatic intervention. As you can see, the somatic interventions alter the brain and body, and then a researcher would see how those changes would affect behavior. The somatic interventions are the independent variables. In experiments involving behavioral intervention, the behavior of individuals is altered in a controlled manner and the consequent alterations of neural structure and function are noted. So, the behavior is the independent variable and the effect it has on the brain and body is the dependent variable. In the correlational approach, the covariance of behavioral and neural events may give rise to hypotheses about the function of the nervous system. Unlike the previous two approaches, correlation cannot infer causation, meaning you can't make a statement like variable A causes variable B to happen. The only way to determine causation is by using an experimental technique where manipulation occurs. Sometimes, many times, it is impossible due to ethical boundaries. Advanced areas of research employ all three approaches. You see, Behavioral interventions are the opposite of somatic interventions. Now, the behavior is being controlled or manipulated by the researchers, and they are looking at how these behavioral changes have an effect on the brain and body. Correlations is just that. Correlations. How is one variable related to another? 
There is no manipulation going on. Just figuring out relationships. Again, you cannot infer causation using correlational research because no change is occurring. In behavioral neuroscience, we utilize all three types of approaches to find out more about the nervous system and how it affects behavior. It emphasizes that relations between brain and behavior are reciprocal. Each affects the other in an ongoing cycle of bodily and behavioral interactions. Let's change topics a bit to neuroplasticity. This is a key term for the entire course. It is your brain's and entire nervous system ability to change or adapt in response to life experiences or the environment. It happens from birth and throughout your entire lifetime. Your brain is doing so right now, trying to encode all this information you are learning right now to store it in your brain. Your brain is literally changing. It's changing its shape right now, just not noticeably different. At least, I hope it is, because if not, then we got a problem. Now you can see the word plastic in the word neuroplasticity. That is because your brain is plastic. No, I don't mean like a plastic Pepsi bottle. I mean it as the literal term, malleable or flexible. Your neurons have the ability to change the location of synapses and even create new synapses to compensate for new information. You'll also see a new term used in the slide, dendritic spines. These are swellings on the dendrites where a synapse occurs. They can be seen in constant motion, changing shape in the course of seconds. The use of animals is critical to neuroscience and most biomedical research. Regulations for the use of animals are in place at the federal, state, and local institutional levels. Despite belief systems where people grant animals the same rights as humans, current legal policies are in place to treat animals ethically and humanely. We use animals to study parts of the brain too because some species have similar brain structures and brain chemistry as humans. If we can figure out how their brains react to certain stimuli, we can infer that the stimuli may have a similar effect on people. However, that is not always the case. Rats are one of the most popular animals to perform research on. Rats are very, very social animals and keeping them in social isolation when growing up can change the way the brain develops. In the rats that were isolated, the posterior dorsal area of the brain which is known to process odors was smaller in isolated male rats. But why that region? To become familiar with their surroundings, including other rats around them, they use their sense of smell. Much like a dog does if you've ever owned one. They are notorious for smelling everything. With the lack of other rats to smell, this could have led to brain changes. It could have also been the stress associated with isolation and just overall lack of odors to investigate. Regardless, social isolation led to changes in the brain. In humans, psychological expectancies can have an impact on the activation of neurons or neural networks in the brain. A neural network is many neurons in one area that are in use for certain functions. When we expect discomfort, we will experience it even though it doesn't even exist. The stimulus may not even be anything that causes discomfort. For example, have you ever seen those videos of people blindfolded and asked to reach their hand in the box to touch something? They're freaking out before they even make contact with the object. They are beginning to feel discomfort or even fear and maybe even pain before they even touch whatever is inside the box. If you haven't, perhaps this will be a reminder. Why is it moving? Why is it moving, bro? Oh my God. Oh my God. He is experiencing fear because he is expecting something dreadful in the box and even perceives motion even though it's just a stuffed animal. Here's another example. There were two groups of people who were told to put their hands into 116 degrees Fahrenheit water. This sounds hot, but it's very bearable. Neither group was told the temperature, just either hot water or very hot water. The left picture of the brain shows the activation of the anterior cingulate cortex. In those who were, not, who were told 
hot water. And the right picture of the brain shows the activation of the same area of the brain and those who were told very hot water. However, the temperature of the water was the exact same. This shows that the socially induced psychological expectancies affected the magnitude of the brain's response. Also, the people who were told very hot reported to feel more pain as well. Researchers use level of analysis to study behavioral neuroscience. This is an experimental approach that allows researchers to study behavior and neuroscience at specific levels. A single level would be studying which neurons are activated when a specific behavior occurs or which region of the brain is activated when a specific behavior occurs. You see how that is two different levels? One is studying an entire brain region while the first one is just studying a single neural network. This is two different levels. Reductionism is the strategy of breaking a system down into smaller parts or lower slash smaller levels in order to understand what is being affected by behavior. Here is reductionism at play. It shows several different levels of analysis, the social level, organ level, neural level, um, etc., down to the molecular level. It also shows how a researcher could study an individual behavior during social interaction. Depending on the question, researchers are trying to find the answer to. Researchers use different techniques to focus on these many levels, but always with an eye toward how their findings apply to behavior. And this is the end of the first lecture for biological psychology. Hope you enjoyed it and I will see you online. Ciao. That electrical, that electro, <laughs> in the rest that were isolated, mm.